we all work within a framework of, of common beliefs. And for me, the pleasing thing now is that the framework of common beliefs <laughs> is changing. And, and there is much more acceptance now for, for no dig, for working with nature. That's exciting. That massive upheaval that you, we inflict on soil, if, if, well, if you're a digger, you do, you know, it, it, the soil has to recover. And one of the recovery mechanisms is weeds. So if you're not doing that, your soil just grows less weeds. And many no diggers are commenting on that. I did a salad tasting with Raymond Blanc a few years ago. And when we got to the chard, he almost spat it out. He said, what that is chard? <laughs> not impressed. Hello and welcome to episode 32 of Talking Dirty over at East Ruston Old Vicarage looking positively tropical with his new background of brugmansias and fantastic summer florals. It's Alan Edward Herbert Gray, our happy and very handsome horticulturalist. You all flatter you. Well, over in Cambridgeshire where the sun is shining and it's coming our way, we have for this Maria Sophia Friedrichsen. And you're beaming, you're beaming today. I like the stripes. Oh, well, I've gone rainbow and we have got sunshine. Yeah. I'm assuming our guest today has sunshine as well because he's not actually very far away from me. He's bathing it. I'm in Cotton, oh, just oh. outside Cambridge. Yeah, let's rub it in, Alex. And yeah. you are at the Cambridge University Botanic Garden where you are a glasshouse supervisor. Alex or Alexander Summers, if you've been naughty. Uh, do you have any middle names to bring to the party? Oh, I do. They're horrendous. I spent my life trying to avoid those. I have two. My, my parents named me after my grandparents, Eugene and Frederick. And they're these horrible names known to man. <laughs> normally, I'm not normally honest about that. Not People don't normally ask me, so I don't normally have to tell them. Alexander Eugene Frederick Summers. Yeah, it's horrible. It's horrendous. It's a bit nicer than Edward Herbert. And I, they were both grandfathers as well. <laughs> uh, at least somebody else got tarred with this brush. I thought I was the only one who got <laughs> stuck with that one. <laughs> Now, by the time this podcast goes out into the world, hopefully your now very famous cactus will have finally flowered because if anyone, you know, watches the news or picks up a newspaper, they will know that at the moment, the big thing occupying all of you at the Botanics is this very rare cactus, which is supposed to flower for the first time in the UK. Am I right? Yeah, so we, we were really fortunate that, um, that that's the case. So we, we got it about... In about 2015 and we've sort of been sat on it since then and then it, it produced a bud in November and as we will all know here plants take a long time sometimes to go from having a small bud to something that's actually a flower so yeah well, it, it's the first one in the UK and um, we're very excited about that we're not often the first when it comes down to plants and uh, in this case after talking to uh, colleagues at other botanic gardens it's clear that's the case and now it could be uh, a little bit faster if, if we'd like it would like and actually open but each day we measure it so it's somewhere in the realms of about 26 centimeters at the moment. Alan you've been part of the online vigil watching to see when this flower finally emerges. I have indeed I mean I, I wait with bated breath I just wish I wish that um, you could bottle the scent and, and uh, uh, the early scent because I think uh, you know that where's the flowers waning as the morning approaches it gets a bit sort of uh, Pongy, I think, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, this is so. Uh, I, Richard Baby came through uh, a number of years back when he was doing Cabaret of Plants, and we he came to see our Victoria bloom, and, and we talked about this, and he said uh, the initial scent ha it's supposed to have the same sort of perfume tones as uh, apparently a similar example would be something like a, a scent called Rihanna, which I thought was hilarious that. Uh, that Richard actually had an idea of, of, of that scent, but I, I, I had to email him the other day just to confirm that that is what he said, because I didn't want to go around saying that. And they say, I, I never mentioned that to you at all. So it must have been the weirdest email out of the blue. Um, so he did confirm that. But I think after that, I'm not too sure what the scent's going to be like. We're, we're told it's something horrible, but um, <laughs> horrible can come in lots of, uh, lots of tones. That Richard Maybe book, Cabaret of Plants, is on my bedside table. You've just reminded me. I was I was just started it and then I got distracted. So thank you for re reminding me to go and read it. The plant itself, are you having to go home and sort of watch the live stream in order to, to know what's going on? Or are you camped out next to it in the glass house? Fortunately, because the glass house hat comes with its own little visitors. So it comes with a whole array of cockroaches. <laughs> one, one thing I don't have any intention of doing is camping down in, in the actual uh, main tropical houses. No, we, we're here and usually until about six or seven at night, um, just double checking and uh, making sure everything's going according to plan. But 
we sort of expect to know by the afternoon before. Um, and that is me being hopeful. <laughs> And before we depart from the cactus, I know that everyone's making you talk about it. You must be sick of talking about this cactus by now. Tell us a bit more about it. How did you come to have it? Um, you know, why, we, why, is, why are there not more of them? Uh, we've been, we were very fortunate with this one. So as we've sort of worked on developing our collections over the past, cool, I've been here now what, eight or nine years developing the collections in the glass houses. It was one of those plants that um, uh, a garden that I really look up to, Bonn Botanic Gardens in Germany, it's one they, they held and one that I was very keen to have in our collections. And so we were very kindly gifted a, a small piece of pad, which uh, we attached to the tree in, in 2015. And since then, it's, it's continued down that line. So, yeah, it's one of those situations where over the course of the years here, you, you get the opportunity to go around these fantastic botanic gardens where I never thought I'd get to go behind the scenes and see all the plants and, and, and come away with bits of them. You know, that's the best bit, eh? Cool. that's the stuff that dreams are made of alan <laughs> it is indeed because one of the things that cambridge is famous for the botanic garden glass houses is the jade vine yeah absolutely is that flowering it's, at the moment it's got flowers on it yeah yeah it's one that it's one of those ones that i arrived all those years ago and i the first thing and i, I probably uh, you probably know this feeling you have a sort of an old climber and the first thing i thought was Let's uh, let's do a restorative prune on this. Let's remove a lot of the uh, the older the older woods. So everyone said to me, "Oh, you know, last year that produced somewhere in the realms of fifty blooms and this, that, and the other." I did a restorative prune because it, it, it got quite old. And uh, anyway, next year it produced just ten flowers. So that was that was great work. And ever since, uh, all of the other horticulturists here never let me live that one down. So it's looking pretty good now i mean I, i'm quite happy with where we're getting back to now it's looking uh, a lot fresher and got a lot more bigger than it did when i first started but um yeah no it's normally a guaranteed bloom from february to, to june it's, it's it's very much as long as you prune it in the right season it's all fine alex just just answer me one thing about this i mean this is it's, it's, it's kind of a fable plant because so few people can actually grow it because it does need an awful lot of heat. What is the, the minimum temperature that it needs? So we, we in our glass house, it's funny you say that. In our glass house, we have it at 18. Uh, and the tropical houses run at a, um, a temperature of a minimum of 18. It comes from uh, the Philippines. So I fortunately, I bumped into a guy a couple of years back who'd been to the area, one of the mountains. It comes from a mountain called Mount Makiling on the island of Luzon. So I said to him, whatever happens, if you get a chance, send me a picture of this back because I really want to see it uh, in the wild. And if you can see a pollinator on it, I'd be amazed because everyone always, there's always this, um, people sort of suggest, oh, it's bat pollinated. But it's not because anyone's seen it pollinated by bats. It's because um, they think it's bat pollinated because of its colour. Anyway, the pictures I got back were as a lo loads of parakeets all over it. So I'm, I'm not absolutely <laughs> convinced it's bat pollinated. But um, we did have seeds on ours, so we had a fortunate situation. The year before I got here, um, a whole load of the flowers mysteriously got pollinated. And my assistant at the time uh, said he saw a little mouse working from flower to flower. So I think we're pretty sure that it was likely a little mouse that got up because you need a relatively large organism to get into the flowers. So that year it also produced lots of seeds. So when I first got here, we, had, we grew up loads of plants. The seeds don't last for long. You've kind of got to sow them within 24 hours of them coming off the plants. And then you sow them and germinate them up. And what we thought was we'd try them at different temperatures. And so uh, we grew some in, in, at, at 12 and they just about work along. So I reckon you could probably do one at about 15 adequately and you might be able to go a little bit lower. But I think you'd probably just need to make sure it was getting some reasonable summer heat. Well, we we'll, 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 we'll should persevere. <laughs> <laughs> that would look rather good at East Rostenville Vicarage. Oh, it would look awesome. But thought is I've got a birthday coming up and I've got to yet get a plant. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> it's a, it would be a good one. It, your, your big, tall glass house there would be an ideal space yeah. actually over at East Ruston. We just planted a couple of mountain papayas, papayas in there. I had the most amazing surprise from a chap called Mike Clifford. You may remember that when we were talking to um, Ben Pres Preston the other day, he man mentioned the mountain papaya. Yes. Well, I opened a parcel this morning with two mountain papayas in it that high that came from, that came from, came from Mike Clifford. And they are going, well, they are. They're planted in my pelly house at the moment. 
So we're going to see if we can get a crop off those in future years. I follow, I follow Mike Clifford on Twitter. It's a fantastic array of plants he holds. Absolutely, yeah, yeah amazing. Mike's Rare Plants? Yep. On, on, on Instagram, I think, is Mike's Rare That's Plants. Right. Mike's Rare Plants on Instagram. Yeah, um, he'll come back, actually, a little bit later on. Is part of my flow-mo. Um. Good. <laughs> I really like that house. So when I came through, is it, is it teak? Yes. Yes. It's, it reminds me of at the glass houses here. That's why... I, it's, it's a lovely space. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's about 16, 18 feet tall at the, at the apex, so it's a good size. Um, yep. And it is, it, it is quite well heated. Um, and, you know, on the coldest day, the coldest day ever, where we were having sort of minus something last week, you could go in there and it's really warm. I mean, like toasty warm, not just um, well, better than. You could definitely do a jade vine if you wanted to. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've got to find one first, Alex. Uh, I think I might know somebody who could give you one. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can come by you, you can give me a jade vine and we can jointly give it to Alan as a birthday present. There yeah, we it's go. Really, actually, they root really easily from cuttings as well. So uh, I think we might be able to deliver that. <laughs> oh, that'd be fantastic. Yeah. Other people for their birthdays might request, you know, normal things. Alan Gray, can I have a jade vine, please? Which is a plant that needs to be seen to be believed. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that colour that color is absolutely bizarre, isn't it? I mean, it's one of yeah. those things that each year it comes out, we have visitors who come back year after year who love seeing that thing. And I know why, because there's just so few plants that deliver that colour. You know, there's, there's a lacanalia that does it and um, there's an ixia, but, but there's not much else that uh, has that bizarre greenish, it's, it's almost a green, blue, yellow, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing. Um, well, I don't know. The Lacanalia is probably all right, but the Ixia, it, again, is a difficult plant to grow. I have one small plant, Ixia viridif viridiflora, um, and I, I mean, I'm just hoping that I can keep it going, but you have to be careful with it. And again, it's, um, it's one of those plants, as you say, Alex, that people will travel miles just to go and look at, just so they can say, I have seen it. Yeah, and, and I think quite right, because they are. it is astonishing colour. And also, because... Like the jade vine, you know, it comes from uh, nice uh, tropical Philippines, but both Lacanalia and Ixia, I mean, it's temperate South Africa. They're absolutely things exactly, that you can yeah. think about at home, aren't yeah. they, really? Yeah. I mean, you say people come from miles around to see the jade vine, but people must come from miles around all through the year to see all kinds of things, particularly in the glass houses. I mean, the botanics is famous for all manner of things, not least at the moment, it's winter garden, which I went for a walk mm. through the other day. And it is just so inspiring. And the longer you spend in it, the more you see. It's quite a small pocket, but you walk up and down and then you just spot all these different plants. And of course, because it's a botanic garden, most things are labelled. So you can sit there, you know, writing notes and taking pictures and building a wish list. Um, but the glass houses, I mean, all year round, they are just astonishing. Yeah, and we're, we're, I mean, I think it's one of those situations where we kind of gifted the situation that if you look at the diversity of plants in the world, they don't they tend to come from everywhere other than the temperate regions so it's kind of fortunate to be able to have the environments to to grow all those sort of things but we've really had an active push over the past um uh past nine ten years to, to to pull in as much material and diversity as we can i mean one of the big things i believe in is all that sort of that, the big five you know a sort of a safari sort of mentality which is you've got to have those plants like victoria or the jade vine to get people through the doors to talk about the other things that we're doing that may be less charismatic or um, not as easy to convey through some of the other plants. So, yeah, no, it, it's awesome. And I love the tropics. I mean, I'm not going to lie. The tropics are awesome full stop. And the plant material is so, it, you know, everything, everything we grow, everything I've bumped into has a story. It's ecology is interesting. It's, it just takes some time to tease that out. Uh, Alex, have you been to Madagascar? No, I'd love to. If there's a ticket waiting there, I'll uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, No, I haven't. Have you? I was just going to tell you, uh, one of my favourite things about the Cambridge um, glass houses, and you're going to think this is weird, is the door furniture. Yeah, I mean, the door, okay. yeah, yeah. The, door <laughs> lobs, the locks, the snacks, I mean, they are just so fantastic. I mean, yeah. the creation of them is fabulous. The, the, the ironwork throughout the houses, because, I mean, it's all it's uh the ironworks mainly sort of 1930s and yeah. i was very pleased actually the other day i was looking you know you bump i don't know about you but when you go around a garden and particularly an old space like this there's always bits that you've never seen before and that you happen to bump into when you're doing something that you never expected to be doing and 
and particularly with the metalwork. I bought, the other day I, I was looking at the metalwork and there was a, a printed bit on the metalwork that said where it was all done. And I come from Nottingham originally, and um, it was done in a little town next to where I grew up in Beeston. <laughs> so I was so pleased to see that the ironwork was done by some local some local people from where I where I grew up. A nice homely touch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's like I was meant to be here. <laughs> yeah. And being a glasshouse supervisor at such a prestigious botanic garden, I mean, what have you been doing today? We're catching up in the afternoon. You've had a lot of hours so far. Obviously, a lot of it possibly occupied by media and cacti at the moment. <laughs> but but yeah, how does your day shape up? So not so normally I spend uh, every morning for the first two hours I sweep and water. In fact, since I was uh, about twenty one. I've swept and watered. Um, uh, I had a, a little bit of time outside when I was at Kew and other places. Um, but uh, most days start with that and then we focus on what we're doing around the, the collections. But at the moment, because we're, we're down our trainees, we're helping other sections. And I had the great benefit uh, in 2016 or 17 to go collecting in Vietnam with Edinburgh. And I was helping today to plant some of my Vietnam collections down in um, uh, down just by our Brookside Gate area. So. That was really quite cool because it's nice to have seen something that I helped to raise. I collected, I helped to raise from seed, and now it's all going out into the wider garden. So yeah, it's been a, it's been a cool day today. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, we have to backtrack a little bit. Talk about that Vietnam collecting trip. Yeah, that was. Uh, it was the first. It was one of those moments where it was very very nice. One of my colleagues, previous colleagues from Q, uh, got in touch, and they were organising a second trip out to Vietnam, so to Sapa, to the uh, Huang Lien Mountains and um, uh, yeah they, they said would you like to join and um, and so it's amazing you get paid to people pay for you to go to amazing parts of the world to see flora and uh, collect it so we spent three weeks there uh, we made 500 collections and they were split between ourselves uh, Royal Botanic Gardens Edinburgh and Glasgow um, and we yeah there was, there was about three or four of us four of us on the trip and that was that was phenomenal. It was a it was the first foray into doing that stuff in the field that wasn't just recording plants or going to see gardens. It was it was actively bringing them back. So yeah, I very much enjoyed that, and uh, it will forever last. You know, forever remain with me. But the nice thing is, those those plants will hopefully be live in perpetuity at the botanic gardens here. Yeah. Wow. You're leaving your mark. Can you tell us what um, what you've been planting out then? What things did you find and bring back and grow on and have now okay. actually put in situ? So we got brought back some magnolias. Um, I brought back, uh, we have Magnolia sapensis, which was only described, uh, I think, in 2009. Um, that we had, they're now the size of me. So it's quite impressive. You bring them back as a seed and now they stand the size of me. Uh, Magnolia sapensis, Magnolia insignis, um, which is another um, uh, reasonably large magnolia, uh, fantastic uh, flowers on these. Uh, Huodendron, which is in Styracaceae. It has the most amazing stem it's sort of bronze uh, colour and um, it really is one for winter gardens of the future if its hardiness proves good. And then, um, yeah, some uh, camellia relatives, things called polyspora. Um, so, yeah, some, it's, there's some really cool stuff. So it's exciting. And, and as you said there, I mean, it's something that's come up a lot on this podcast. The gardeners like Alan, like Jimmy Blake at Huntingbrook, who are trying out things in gardens. You know, Alan's garden is pretty sheltered, so you, you can get away with a lot. But something like Huntingbrook, I mean, he was absolutely covered in snow seemingly for weeks and testing out all of these plants. It's really important to work out how viable they are so that the rest of us can have a go. Yeah, and I think that's, that's the thing. I think there's also the degree of jealousy for other gardens. I came through... Uh, East Rushton and I, I, your tetrapanics, how the hell you do that is beyond me because I have mine in the bays around our glass houses which is which is reasonably sheltered and we come through and you also are like uh, they're mammoth <laughs> well yeah but I mean uh, I think we're um, I think we're lucky you know Alex because we didn't realize that when, but when we bought the house um, 40 years ago, more, um, on a winter's day, you could drive inland and you suddenly see frost on the sides of the road, which you hadn't got at home. So do, um, you get, do, you get, um, do you get below freezing? Oh, yeah, yeah. We've, we've had minus two this past week, um, you know, with the snow and everything, uh, yes. Um, and quite a lot of that will have done damage to what we do. I mean, that's, it's rare. Yeah. Um, we don't often have that much frost, but I mean, quite a lot of that will have done, dam done some damage. But I hope for the amount of time that we had the frost, it's re relatively superficial damage. 
Yeah. But the, yeah. But the Tetra Panax, I mean, they just sort of seem, they sudden, well, they, I think they've taken a shine to us. They like us. Um, <laughs> but we, you know, we, we have that maritime influence in the winter that, um, and the salt, I suppose, helps to keep the frost away. Yeah, um, it's, I mean, it makes for a fantastic, because to see them, like, I'd never seen tetrapanics like that, and it was, it was a, a sort of a, I spent hours underneath it photographing it, which I think lots of people must do with the, you know, the leaves against the sky, and it just, it was one of those moments where you go to gardens and you know you're never going to forget that moment, because that, you know, some... This is so strange, Alex, because I see that every day. So, I mean, you know, I don't spend hours underneath it photographing it. But, if, <laughs> you know, I remember when I first went to um, um, a garden in uh, Cornwall and uh, tree bar, and I, f I saw bananas, huge, tall bananas. And I, I mean, I was in awe of them and I photographed them and with my little camera that I had at the time and all the rest of it. And I looked at them and I thought, who the hell would ever want to grow these ugly plants because their leaves are all shredded and goodness knows what. And, you know, 35 years later, here we are. We've got stands of them at East Ruston. It's, it's ridiculous, really. But I mean, the first time you see these things and these plants, whatever they are, growing well in another garden, it is awe-inspiring, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think if it, if I ever lose that, I know that I should change um, change profession because it is those moments where you go through gardens and you stop and you go, wow. And yeah. you think if I could just do a little bit of that where I'm working, I'll be a happy person. Exactly. You're doing a lot of it. You're doing you're doing a good job. Uh, I always come through those glass houses at the botanics and go, wow, there's always something to stop you on your tracks. I'm not sure what you brought along today. I know you scurried off before the podcast officially started to get yeah. a little bit of show and tell. What did you bring? Well, so I'm I really like parasitic plants. It's like my uh, my little, uh, you know, <laughs> secret uh, interest. Um, and I have slowly over the years tried to bring stuff in. And just before Christmas, I had the real bonus. What with Brexit coming and all of the change in plant um, health regulations and what we can move between the continent, it got to the point where some of my friends had promised me for a long while um, uh, a, a, a mistletoe species that grows in um, euphorbia. So this, is, this, this large mothership of a euphorbia is euphorbia horrida. And um, if I just come close up to the camera... You can see loads of little mistletoes coming outside, coming out of it. So that is um, a tiny little mist mistletoe, nicely named Viscum minimum. And um, uh, yeah, it's really amazing. It's, it's one of the most uh, bizarre plants you can imagine. So it comes from South Africa and um, it, it grows in a very small area uh, region just down on the east, just, just moving into the eastern side of the Cape. Uh, yeah, and it's one of those things I've wanted to have for ages. And then equally, uh, I was out, we went out plant collecting in South Africa in 20, 2017, I think. I, I'm not always great with dates. Um, and we were out in the Richtersveld, which is just in the uh, northwest, uh, just ac across from the Namibian border. And we got the benefit of go going to Kirstenbosch when we got back down into Cape Town. So I was with um, a colleague at Kew and with our assistant curator here. And when we went to Kirstenbosch, because we had all of the because we could use the, the quarantine house at Kew, the succulent curator at Kirsten Bosch basically said, well, you can have whatever you want then. And basically the Kirsten Bosch's main aim is to collect South African flora. So, you know, we're going through all of their succulent collections saying, well, we'd like a little bit of that and that'd be great. And this is cool. And I remember going through the conservatory and I really wanted, um, there's this, uh, so there's this great relative called Cyphostemma. And there's, uh, we grow Jute, which is a, a succulent and it grows to about, uh, probably the size of, um, you know, one or two feet. And there's one species called Cyphostemma curori, which comes from up in Namibia. And it grows, it grows, it's like a small tree. And I was like, I really want a bit of that. And it's just as you go in the um, conservatory and he said, okay, then he just snapped a branch off it for me and handed it to me. But equally, we went through the back area and there's, a, there's another mistletoe. There's one called Viscum crestulare. So this is something that probably we've all bumped into the Portularia uh, afra, which is, um, I'm terrible with common names, but uh, I know it's Portularia afra, which is uh, a commonly growing plant in people's houses. But there is a, there's a mistletoe also in this one as well. Let me just move the uh, other one out of the way. So if I just come around here and it look, the mistletoe looks absolutely the same. So we've got, um, uh, if I just go up there, can you see the mistletoe just coming? Hang on, let, you see it there? just in the center of the image. So you see where the, the stems fork and then on the left-hand side of that fork there, hang on a minute, <laughs> I drop it on the, 
as long as I don't, I don't mind breaking the computer, I don't want to break the plant. Uh, <laughs> there, that, that there oh. <laughs> is, a, is another mistletoe. So it's a one that grows on succulent species from, um, from the Eastern Cape. And um, yeah, we brought back seeds of that. And then my, me and my friend at Kew, we sowed it on some of these at Kew and we raised it up. So it sort of adds to those uh, weird parasites that I try to stick into the collections all over. <laughs> I don't think I'd realised that the mistletoe family was so broad, which feels really dumb because obviously most plant families are way broader than we necessarily think. And there are so many different plants out there. But yeah, that, that's just, um, I'd never thought about that. Where did, your, where did your love of parasitic plants come from? <laughs> I think it's inspired by when I was here as a trainee. So when I was a trainee, um, I, I think it comes from being a kid in Rafflesia. I was always in awe of, of like, of this bizarre flower from the tropics. But when I came here as a trainee, I'd never really seen mistletoe that much because it's, it's really got an ad hoc distribution. Like some places it's really common and you can go for ages and not just not see it. And then it's really common again. And at the gardens, it's all through the trees. So when I was a trainee here, I was, my parents have a little orchard and I was brought up in this little old orchard. And when I, when I was a trainee here, I went around and got the seed off the uh, mistletoe and spread it all through their orchard um and so that's all now covered in mistletoe um so i was really chuffed to sort of seed it there and then uh we also have something called uh toothwort which is uh lathraea clandestina and uh, that's a really cool thing as well and it grows all around the lake and it grows on everything from the metasequoia right through to a whole array of uh, shrubs and things like salix and so i was sort of fascinated by those and when i went to kew i had the opportunity to sort of follow that through and um yeah, just check out the amazing diversity of these bizarre life forms. <laughs> Does your kind of general interest in parasitic plants branch out, pardon the pun, into epiphytes? Uh, yeah, no, I, I, <laughs> funny. I've been busily preparing. We've been preparing to do an epiphyte wall for the garden. So a big nine metre long uh, wall of them. So over the past two or three years, I've been bringing in uh, epiphytes from across the plant kingdom. So I don't just want obvious bromeliads or... Um, orchids um and we want them from across the family so things in solanaceae things in uh you know commonlinaceae all these bizarre epiphytes so um yeah I, I put it this way if it's a plant i'm usually going to find some reason to be interested in it so <laughs> it doesn't take much for me to to want to grow something when will we be able to come and see the wall of epiphytes that sounds amazing uh, that's uh, COVID uh, put a big hole in that for the moment. So I think at the moment we it's one of those ones that's on hold. So yeah, no, it's I think it's like any part of a garden. You, in your head, you sort of get into a space and you go, I'd, I'd like to do that, and then it grows from more than that. So you know, and we have to go to get the steelwork designed and this, that, and the other. And we've passed that stage, but uh, we've got all the plant material. But you know, it just has to be installed. You say that, you know, this yeah. is a project you've planned and no one saw a pandemic coming. And then you must have ended up with a whole lot of plant material that you've got to kind of keep on hold. Logistically, is that a problem for you at the botanics or do you just have so much sort of space that you're OK? <laughs> no, it's, uh, space is always uh, the big issue. We have, for example, you know, from the years uh, about in 2017, we pollinated the Titanarum here and we've got I've got 160 young titanarums you know and each time they go up a pot size i can assure you it goes from like you know a one liter long tom to they're now in 10 liters and and uh, i don't have 160 in 10 liters i can assure you <laughs> i've got i still have 160 other things so space is always is always an issue so yeah now we got a lot of material from berlin and from bonn and from kew and edinburgh and from all around and that just has to tick over for the time being so it's all potted Fortunately, with epiphytic stuff, it, it's actually quite easy potted. So it's not like some of the other stuff, which um, wants to be out in the beds as soon as it can be. So, yeah, no, uh, yeah, I, I'm sure my assistant may not agree with me all the time on that. But, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty reasonable. <laughs> and you alluded earlier to the fact that you'd kind of had to go out and help on a different team. One of the things that I think might have been a bit overlooked with the pandemic is how big a role people like volunteers play at, yeah. at certain organisations and, and how impacted that has been by all the various lockdowns and people shielding and stuff. Yeah, and we have training staff, you know, we have we have seven trainees normally each year and they're a ma massively important component of our staff and, and hopefully we add to the industry through doing that, you know, that one year training programme. 
And we haven't had the, those this, this year in part because, you know, we need to be able to social distance within the workplace. Um, so, yeah, we are down essentially a third of our workforce without taking in volunteers. I have a, a, a three volunteers, each of them who are phenomenal. You know, one of them, two, a, a, two days every week he comes in. He's grown orchids for 40 years. We write for the orchid review together. Um, he's just the most amazing guy. And I, I feel blessed to even have had the opportunity to work with him for the past six years. And, you know, he's a, vo he's a volunteer. I always hate that word because it under undermines how much he really knows. And the same for my, the, I have one who looks at after ferns and bryophytes. So I have to grow a lot of liverworts because we've got a research side to things. So the sort of things you never would imagine that people have to grow. <laughs> and then uh, another one who looks after all our succulents and um, and uh, that stuff so supports us on that. So, yeah, no, I mean, we, we have this huge uh, array of extra staff who, uh, or, or um, people on site who, who su support with things. And without those, it, yeah, it really stretches us, to be honest. And that's, you know, on, on top of the fact that, as you alluded to there, you are not only a garden that's open to the public. I mean, Alan knows the pressures of that opening a huge part of the year. And you've got to somehow be a functioning garden and doing, you know, all of those necessary jobs while also making sure that everything looks beautiful for the public and, uh, and is safe and all of that. But on top of that, you mentioned there, there's the scientific side and the kind of trialing side of being a, a botanic garden. Yeah, so, you know, we're part of the university, so a major component is supporting researchers and supporting research needs. So, you know, quite often somebody will, you know, will get people come through and they want to work on this or they need to take material from that to extract uh, DNA or something like that. So, you know, it, it always comes down to that. So, for example, recently we had a researcher who's working um, on uh, mycorrhizal association or plant mycorrhizal associations and how they develop. And then we got a little carex that needed um raising from seed to, from the tibetan plateau and then we had to work out does it need stratifying does it not need stratifying so there's always those little bits and you know being a collection it all has to still be alive at the end of the year so <laughs> it's kind of one of those situations where there's always a, a lot of plates to juggle but i think that's great gardens generally you know anybody who has a garden doesn't want to lose the plants in it so you know we all spend hours i'm sure you have this at east Rushton, you know just making sure that the things still exist at the end of the year and that sometimes means you end up doing ludicrous things with your plants <laughs> yeah like, like propagating too many of them <laughs> yeah i know that feeling i know that feeling <laughs> do you also have to do a lot of paperwork and a lot of document like you said you needed to work out whether that seed needed stratification you i assume are then also documenting all of that um, and keeping yeah. records yeah so we have a date there's a big database called bg iris and uh you can actually access it from uh, the garden's website through a portal, you know, so that we allow researchers to get in and, and use the material as and as they require. Um, but yeah, that all does. So if you imagine my section is about three and a half thousand accessions and uh, I do a full audit on them, hopefully, our curator hopes anyway, I do, I do, uh, <laughs> on a rotation of um, about 700 a year. But that that's, there's lots of other stuff that has to go through on that as well. So yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's constant. It, that, that record side of it I like because, you know, we, we've got plants here that, for example, the other day I was dealing with a, one of the trees in our tropical house and I, you go back to the record and you can suddenly see that it came into the gardens, you know, in, say, for example, the 1950s or the 1960s. And then you start reading the record. And you're like, wow, this came from Nigeria. Wow. And then and then suddenly to the point where you might be able to pinpoint exactly where it was collected. You know, I had we have um, a camphor tree, which which we originally got from Nan Nanking. And that's, you know, and then when I started to look into that, that's one of the major areas of plantation for uh, for that for that species in um, in China. So it's, it's really neat. You know, those, those the database holds so much cool stuff and it would be so lovely if lots more of it was available to everybody to see. I bet you lose hours in that database. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's funny, isn't it? I, I didn't come into it to sit in front of computers. It, it, you know, I love being outside and working the pants, but I love what I love what the database has in it, and I like to keep adding to it. Which actually brings us round to Flomo, which is one of my favourite parts of the podcast, where we sort of all share the things that we desperately want to grow. And I think some of our guests find it easier than others. Some people are just inundated; they have a massive book uh, full of plants they want to grow. I suppose. Uh, being at a botanic garden it sort of is like that you're constantly looking for the things that you can add to the collection yeah yeah I mean I, I couldn't bring in my bookcase today so uh and I can assure you my bookcase 
absolutely rammed full of monographs and this, that, and the other, but um, all the time, really, you know, and I have friends and colleagues and that's the beauty. I think that's the most amazing thing of horticulture and botany. You know, I speak to people all the time about plants, you know, it's not, it's not a job. It's, you know, it's like it's a lifestyle and you, you spend your life going to see gardens, going to see plants in the wild. And uh, there's always a plant that comes on your radar and you go, wow, that's really cool. I want to grow that. And so, uh, you know, I think I could, I could list, I could write lists upon lists and, um, and still not even touch, you know, scratch the surface. You'd need a whole podcast series just to get through your wish list. Yeah, I, th I think people would be intensely bored and I think that uh, <laughs> it might be on some st channel streamed at the back of, uh, you know, some other platform. <laughs> um, so what, what would be top of your list? What is your kind of proper top Flomo at the moment? Well, uh, so I brought in my book. I've had it since I was uh, a diploma student at Kew. And fortunately, so Raflicio of the World, which is, um, yeah, I, I love this book. Um, and Raflicio is my plant that I'd love to grow. I... So when I was uh, talking about parasites, you know, parasites, I think that I really like. And the largest flower in the world is a parasite. It's uh, Raflesia. It's uh, it's in it's closely related to Euphorbias or Euphorbiaceae. Not that you tell from the from the flower, but um, it grows as a parasite completely. Its whole life start, life cycle is within inside a vine. And and when I say a vine, actually in the same family as Vitaceae as as the vines that we get grapes from, and then. The only point at which you see it is when the flowers emerge and over the course of nine months, this bud grows and grows and grows and then it opens and it's like this bizarre red shaped sort of urn with five lobes on it and it smells horrendous. So I have a terrible sense of smell. So I love all the things that smell really bad because it's about the only things I can ever smell. So, you know, we have a whole array of like with orchids. I really like orchids and me and uh, the orchid, uh, my, uh, uh, the orchid guy, Phil, we, you know, the, the main group of orchids we really like are the ones that really smell bad. <laughs> um, but in the case of this, I have I had the real, um, oh, it was like the most amazing opportunity. When I, uh, my third year at Q, I did a travel scholarship out to Borneo and I, um, and I saw not the biggest species in the world, but a species related to that and 30 centimetres across. And it was just, oh, it's just the most amazing plant. It's the truly bizarrest, weirdest thing. And it's never been grown outside of its natural habitat. Well, it has... It has, it has been grown, but not no no temperate botanic garden has ever grown it. So it's it's been grown in Southeast Asia, but not not by anybody outside of Southeast Asia. Alex, that flower reminds me of something that I grew when I was a child. I think I've still got it um, amongst my cacti and succulent collection, and that was a stapelia. Yeah, it looks it, it looks very similar. Yeah, is it related? Not at all. Not at all. No. But it's do. But the reason, the reason it does is because they both depend on flies to pollinate them. So Exactly. But, I mean, Stapelia was a great fun plant for me when I said Auntie Patty came round on Sunday afternoon and I said, you must come and smell this. <laughs> <laughs> you horrible child, she said. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the beauty of it. And we always say about the horrible smelling stuff is people go, oh, that smells horrible. They always come back for a second smell. It's, that, it's, it's sort of an addictive process, isn't it? You go in, you smell it, you go, oh, it's horrible. And then you find yourself, you know, just checking to see, oh, yeah, it's terrible. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, I absolutely adore them. Um, and you're absolutely right. I mean, that's exactly, this is just, if you imagine in being in a massive tropical rainforest, you kind of, uh, flies are sort of tapped in. If they're going to lay their eggs on something, they want it to be the best uh, situation for their organisms to grow and develop. So what, what the, from, uh, from their perspective, they're looking for the biggest piece of rotting carrion they can find. And so what the Raphlesia does is by providing this absolutely huge structure, if you're a fly going over, you're like, whoa, this is the best place I could ever lay my eggs. And so Raphlesia has taken that to the extreme. It's just the most bizarre, incredible thing. And if I could grow one thing, if I could grow one thing, that would be it. So, um, so yeah. <laughs> that is amazing. It's well worth having a, a Flomo for something that is quite unattainable. You can see why that's top of the list. It's like one yeah, day... I I think it will forever remain a pipe dream, but I will, if I ever get the opportunity, I will jump at it. 
Now I'm going to go next because Alan always outdoes me, um, as you can, you know, in everything, um, but as you can well imagine. So I'm going to go second on our FLOMO. And I mentioned that Mike Clifford would come back onto the podcast. Um, Mike's Rare Plants posted a picture at some point. I can't remember when. I'd kind of screenshot it and I came across it on my phone the other day. Of, I think it was a colocasia, an elephant's ear. This amazing, big, pointed leaf with fantastic purple veining so I've been looking up and I it, he hadn't said which one it was so Mike do tell me if you know but I think it might have been blue Hawaii and it was just mind-blowingly beautiful and I'll probably never grow it but that's certainly something that immediately I sort of screenshotted and just stared in awe at this amazing amazing plant um just one of the many amazing things that Mike grows really <laughs> they are very cool aren't they because uh, I worked at Longwood for a year and they were we we grew a lot of very cool colocasia cultivars because uh, those hot tropical summers are uh, just perfect for it over in the states um, and they have so many so much diversity in uh, in, in leaf form and color yeah and, and you know we, we often I am I am a real um I'm really guilty of being drawn to flower I mean I think that's probably what first drew me into gardening was beautiful flowers and I love flowers for cutting and all of that but I think increasingly you do find yourself more and more drawn to the fantastic foliage. So um, so no wonder really that stopped me in my tracks. Mr. Gray, what's your FLOMO then? Well, there was a little pre press release from Kew Gardens today uh, and it's about a plant which is commonly known as, I'll have to read this, so excuse me, it's Falso Magwe Grande or McDougal Century plant, which is for Fakraya. Um, oh, and cool, I yeah. Fakraya longieva with the um, yucca-like glaucous leaves, which are quite soft and glabrous, really. Um, they're not stiff like a yucca. And we get that to flower, and it sends up this huge candelabrum in a pot to about mm, 8 to 12 feet tall, I suppose. And it branches, and then we get these lovely green and very creamy bell-like flowers hanging there. And further up the inflorescence, it makes babies. So it makes these little sort of, um, well, they're embryonic plants in actual fact. And then if it doesn't get pollinated, they fall to the ground. And, you know, you've got, so that's, it's two ways because it's monocarpic of cropping itself. And I'll just hold this up. hope that you can see it. Um, that is the flower. Awesome, that is. They are, they're the most massive things, aren't they, for crayons? I think when I was on Madeira, I think I saw some. And they're not something I've ever really grown. And they're, they're absolutely massive. Yeah, I've got a couple in pots at the moment. And I mean, we just grow them from year to year and they take probably between five and 10 years before they get to flowering size. And I, <laughs> all my life, I've wanted to have a pair of them. And, you know, if they, you know what I'm going to say, they never flower together. One will do it in, in this year and the other one will do it three years later. So you just can't rely on them. But I'm, I hopefully one year we will get a pair in flower, but they're not difficult to flower and they are spectacular when they do flower. They sound a lot more rewarding than uh, agave. Then they sound like because you get because you know you're going to get a flower within a reasonable time. Yeah, it sounds exactly. like you get a similar look, exactly. but with I a mean, you have flower. To wait years and years and years, like you have to for an agave. But um, one of the things that I always sort of bear in mind is the fact that if they will grow outside on the Isle of Guernsey, we can't be far behind. <laughs> and I know that they grow outside on the Isle of Guernsey because I planted them there many years ago, um, and uh, you. know, you know, their exotic garden is much more probably exotic than ours. Although, of course, they did have a few horrendous temperatures last week as well. Yeah, I was my um, my assistant. She worked on Tresco for a year, and she was saying they. I think they they had snow forecasts last week, which is always a worry in those in those areas. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. if people want to see more on your Fakrayas, I'm fairly certain at some point over the past years, we recorded a video at East Ruston from the Get Gardening YouTube channel. So Alan, I'll try and link to that so people can go and have a have a little look at this extraordinary yeah, plant. Nice. And I told you he would outdo me. I told you. <laughs> <laughs> he always does. <laughs> How oh, amazingly, our time is hurtling by. We've been talking for ages already. So before we go, we've had a couple of questions come in. Um, we haven't done questions for a while. I think because it was winter, people didn't send many in. Remember, you can always email hello at getgardeningnow.co.uk and, um, and you can always post a comment on a YouTube video for us to come to. Uh, somebody was very hopeful. Stacey had, um, had been bought some tulips. I assume just, you know, from the shops, a nice bunch of tulips and had let them go to seed and wondered when you've got, you know, floristry tulips, Alan, can you grow that seed on and how would you go about doing it 
Well, I mean, I think, well, the, first of all, I'd say, have a go. If you've got the space, have a go. You never know. Um, but I wouldn't think possibly the seed is viable because I, I would think once the bulb has been, the, the stem has been cut, it's not going to get enough nutrients out there to actually make a, up there to make a viable seed. That is my first feeling. Um, the second thing I would say is if you do want to sow it, you know, get some proprietary seed compost, um, what I do with tulips, I do grow tulips from seed, as you know, we've done a video on that as well. And it was, um, what's the red tulip called? I'm testing Sprangeri. it. Now. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Tulipa sprangeri. Um, and, you know, you just sow it, put a layer of gravel over the top of the seed on top of the compost and put it outside somewhere sheltered, obviously. I put mine under an outside bench and they, they ger germinated in about... I think it was, they'd been germinated for probably three to four years when we actually found the bulbs. And the great thing of course, spring tulips is because they're species, the bulbs are much smaller than these big fat chaps you get from Holland who have been pumped full of steroids and everything <laughs> else to give you huge, great big boiled eggs on sticks. <laughs> and nothing graceful about them at all. Um, but you know, uh, no, have a go by all means. If you've got the seed, have a go and see. If it doesn't germinate by probably the end of July, I'd throw the whole lot out, but don't chuck the compost away, put it on the garden, make use of it. And other question, and Alex, I'm gonna put you on the spot and make you answer this. Um, as a follow up to Jimmy Blake's podcast, he talked a lot about getting excited, sowing bananas and he'd sown them too early and they hadn't overwintered well. But that, I think, inspired Jeffrey to ask about banana germination. He would love to get better germination on his banana seeds. Currently, his germination rate is something like two out of 25, which he describes as not very good. <laughs> I think that's very good. <laughs> <laughs> what can he do better? Have you got any advice for Jeffrey? So I think um, I, I, my experience of bananas is very similar and it comes down to viability on seeds. So I think the fresher the seed that you can get, the better. So I think, you know, if he's getting hold of seed or if it's going through, through a seed company, ask them when, when they collected the seed, when, when did it come about? And then once you've got it, um, I always find heat is the key to, to seed, to larger seeds, particularly from the tropics. So I would pack it in a bag of moist perlite and, um, and put it somewhere warm. So like an airing cupboard at, the, at about, you know, the closer you can have for us we keep it about 25 or 30 so the closer you can have it up to that it just encourages germination on those big seeds but i've had the similar experiences with bananas and it comes down to seed viability i'm sure of it yeah so it's probably nothing you're doing wrong jeffrey but uh jeffrey's enjoying the podcast uh, so you can come again and ask as many questions as you like if you're enjoying the podcast <laughs> and you're gonna tell us um alex it's been such a treat to catch up with you um please come back another time and uh, and share all of your wonderful planty tales from one of my favorite gardens thank you so much it's been awesome guys it's so nice I love talking plants and it's so nice to sort of just uh, ramble along about uh, something I'm really into and, and, a, and, a, and a collection I love. So, yeah, thank you for having me. And fingers crossed your cactus will flower. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. This is, this is it now. I'm going to go and get back on the camp bed and uh, wait for another night in the glass house. I, I just want to see you in the middle of the night with your face on the telly when the flowers, you on one side and the flower on the other. And I'm <laughs> going to say I know that guy. <laughs> <laughs> There's hopefully. I think somebody saw somebody saw uh, another little critter the other night. So it's like all we need to do is make sure that no animal decides that that is its next best food item. No, 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 no. Oh, can you imagine? <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't. I, I can't. <laughs> It'll kill me. <laughs> Alex, thank you very much, and happy gardening. All the best. Has that madman got shorts on? Yep, <laughs> he has. <laughs> Bless you. said thank you he's behind you <laughs> there he is what happened to your background that's very exciting well i thought it's such a bloody miserable day we did we we just borrow a little bit of summertime oh look oh we've gained a popsicle we've got to have margot margot's grown so much since i saw her <laughs> hey.